before we take the, uh, the offering today, uh, we're going to call up Denora to come and share a little bit about Black History Month. And uh, so give her your attention. Give her a warm welcome. Can you do that? <laughs> Denora, God bless you. Thank you for your research. Good morning, church. I'm going to get right to it. I have um, five people I'd like to speak on, and specifically their contribution to the, the Christian community. So the first three are African Americans, and the last two are Afro-Latinos. Phyllis Wheatley. Wheatley was one of the first black Christian women to be recognized in the United States. Wheatley was the first African-American author of a published book of poetry. Born in West Africa, she was sold into slavery at the age of seven or eight and transported to North America, enslaved by the Wheatley family of Boston. Her poetry made her very noteworthy and even garnered attention from ranking government members, including President George Washington. Wheatley would write poems about political issues, but was most well known for her religious writings. Wheatley was a pioneer of Christian writings, not to simply praise God, but to highlight the problem of slavery in a Christian context. William Joseph Seymour. William Joseph Seymour was a prominent African-American religious leader in the early 20th century. An ordained minister and the son of freed slaves, he is regarded as one of the founders of modern Pentecostalism. Seymour founded the Azusa Street Revival, an influential event in the rise of the Pentecostal and charismatic movements. The revival acted as a catalyst for the spread of Pentecostal practices, such as speaking in tongues and integrated worship throughout the world. It also played an important role in the history of most major Pentecostal denominations. Clara Brown. Clara Brown was a former enslaved woman from Virginia who became a community leader, philanthropist, and aided settlement of former slaves during the time of Colorado's gold rush. She was known as the Angel of the Rockies and made her mark as Colorado's first black settler and a prosperous entrepreneur. When Brown was 56 years of age, she received her freedom and required by law to leave the state. She worked her way west as a cook and laundress to Denver, Colorado, and was affectionately known as Aunt Clara for her emotional and financial support. She began holding prayer services in her home, which eventually evolved into the formation of a non-denominational Protestant church. Her home was always open as a place of worship and refuge for those in need. Agustina Luvis Nunez. Luis Nunez is a Puerto Rican theologian living and doing theology in the island. A lifelong learner, she holds several degrees, including Bachelor of Science in Biology and Medical Technology, and a PhD in Systematic Theology. Currently, she serves as Associate Professor and Director at the Theological Seminary of Puerto Rico. Dr. Luvis's areas of interest include Pentecostal and feminist theologies. Last but certainly not least, we have Mariano Rivera. Mariano Rivera is, is one of Pastor's favorites, uh, and they, they do live in a, the same neighborhood or used to. Um, Mariano Rivera is a Panamanian American former professional baseball pitcher who played 19 seasons in Major League Baseball for the New York Yankees from 1995 to 2013. Nicknamed Mo and Sandman, he spent most of his career as a relief pitcher and served as the Yankees' closer for 17 seasons. In 2019, he was named on all 425 ballots submitted by the electorate of the Baseball Hall of Fame, becoming the first unanimous inductee in the history of that institution. Mariano did not grow up in church, but converted to Christianity at the age of 21. He has funded multiple church startups, including Refugio de Esperanza, which is Refuge of Hope, a church plant in New Rochelle, New York, where his wife, Clara, serves as senior pastor. He does also have other foundations um, and contributes in, in many ways to the um, 
the Hispanic community and the church community. In 2019, Rivera was recognized with the highest civilian award, the Presidential Medal of Freedom for his contribution to the culture of sports and for his tireless philanthropic work. Mariano and his wife reside in White Plains, New York. Thank you so much for your wonderful attention. Have a blessed rest of the service. So anyway, good morning once again. We welcome everyone here. Um, if you've been coming the last couple of weeks, uh, you've noticed we've been highlighting some, uh, some people uh, in recognition of Black History Month. Um, I must say that the events of last year uh, deeply affected our community in Haverhill, and as such, it, it affected our church. That's why we're doing what we're doing. We're trying to bring some awareness, some recognition, some appreciation, some, you know, some, uh, some sympathy, and uh, to create some understanding among the body of Christ. And so uh, that's why Denora had that wonderful presentation today. Next Sunday, our brother Paul Mayo will be presenting his monthly unity uh, message, so that will, that will take care of that. But uh, today, we're very blessed to have with us, I think many of you have already greeted uh, Alan and Tori Rogers sitting here in the front. Um, we welcome you back to New Life Christian Assembly. So good to have you. Uh, in case you don't know, um, Tori uh, is the daughter of uh, brother and sister Hobbs, having grown up at Rehoboth Lighthouse here in Haverhill. Uh, Alan uh, was also employed there for a while, ministering there. Uh, Tori's been brought up in a family of preachers, I guess you could say. And um, they then uh, were with us for several years, a few years ago. And uh, since then, they've been quite busy doing God's work in various ways. Let me just mention a couple here. Uh, every Tuesday night, they, uh, they host a, a Facebook live stream. Their ministry is called We Become Church. So every Tuesday night at 730, they have a Bible study. And they're creating a, a following doing that. Uh, they were on the Christian radio station 590 a while back uh, with a special presentation. Uh, they are also involved in Fusion Church up in Lowell. And uh, re recently, I would say that uh, the, the Lord has been opening up doors for Tori and Alan to go to different places to preach and to share the word of God. So I don't know, the Lord put it on my heart to invite Tori to come to preach today. And I'm so glad he did that. I'm so glad I acted on that because I heard the message this morning and earlier, it's a great message. So uh, if you would, please give our dear sister, Tori Rogers, a warm welcome as she comes to share the word of God today. Tori, God bless you. Welcome back to the pulpit this morning. Hallelujah. Good morning. Okay. It works. <laughs> good to be here. Thank you, Pastor, for the invitation. So good to see everyone again um, and new faces. Hi. <laughs> I'm Tori. This is Alan. <laughs> um, so in speaking on Black History Month, um, I want to focus on the Word of God, but I want to kind of do some parallels between the black experience and the story that we're going to be going through. Um, if you are not black or of black descent, don't worry. It includes you. <laughs> You're in on this too, because a lot of this is just the human experience. Um, I'm going to be kind of touching on things from the black perspective, because that's what I'm an expert in. Um, and so in speaking about Black History Month, and there was you know, some people question, well, why do we need this, or why are we doing this? Um, and this is just my opinion. But I think that it's necessary because a lot of times in our society, blacks aren't viewed as the people they are. Um, and by that, I mean nobody cares. <laughs> and it's not to say that they need special recognition or attention, but their efforts are often minimized, negated. You know, other people um, don't see the value in their lives and their contributions. Um, and so that's why I think that it's important that we do this. Um, and I thank New Life Church for, you know, doing this and what they're doing in the different presentations. Um, because it's not just black history. It's the contributions of blacks to world history, American history, your history. 
the same way that we know the contributions of other people, why would we not include blacks in that? Um, and so this is why it's important. Um, as far as blacks in the Bible or people of color in the Bible, um, there's many, too many to count. Oftentimes, the illustrations will reflect the opinions and the look of the illustrator. And so this is why we have a blonde Jesus. Um, but if you've ever been to the Middle East, you don't see a lot of blondes. <laughs> um, so we're, when we go by things that are presented rather than things that are factual, we can get things a little bit marred. Um, and so of the many people, and I'm not going to get into all of them, but for example, Moses' wife, she was a sister. Look it up. She was from Ethiopia. <laughs> um, and because of that, um, his sister Miriam had a problem with it, her and Aaron. And they're like, who do you think he is marrying someone of that, you know? And God was so upset with it that he cursed them with leprosy. Instantly, Miriam had leprosy because she spoke out against the man of God. Um, and so for those that, you know, have opinions about interracial marriages and think that it's the church's stands, read your Bible because it's not how God feels. Um, Bathsheba. Yeah, in the lineage of Christ, mind you, <laughs> was another one. Apollos, fundamental to establishing the churches in Ephesus and Corinth, possibly the writer of Hebrews. But they're present. They're there. And that's important because representation matters. And so when you're presented a gospel that doesn't include you but is going to dictate to you who you are and how you should live, it's, it's difficult to accept. And so it's important that we, as people, all people, see ourselves in the Bible. Um, and not just in the color of our skin, um, but also in our personal relations. How do I fit into this? What does this have to do with me? That's what we're going to get into. All right, so of all the people um, in the Bible, God directed me to speak on Jacob. And so I'm going to be kind of going through some of the things in his life, hitting the high points and some low spots. Um, buckle up. It's going to be interesting. Um, going to start in Genesis 25. I'm going to be perusing through 28 through 20 through 28. I read out the New Living Translation, so if your Bible's different, it's okay. It's still God's word. We're going to be all right. Um, if you don't have your Bibles with you or you're someone who takes notes, feel free to kind of jot things down because I will be having a lot of different scriptures um, and going around. Starting off at 20. When Isaac was 40 years old, he married Rebekah, the daughter of Bethuel, the Aramean, from Padanaram, and the sister of Laban, the Aramean. Isaac pleaded with the Lord on behalf of his wife because she was unable to have children. The Lord answered Isaac's prayer, and Rebekah became pregnant with twins. But the two children struggled within her womb. And so she asked the Lord about it. Why is this happening to me, she said. And the Lord told her, the sons in your womb will become two nations. From the very beginning, the nations will be rivals. One nation will be stronger than the other, and the older will serve the younger. And the time gave birth, um, the time came for Rebecca to give birth, and she did indeed have twins. The first was very red and covered with hair, like a thick fur coat. So they named him Esau. The other twin was born grabbing Esau's heel, so they named him Jacob, which means like supplanter or you know, deceiver, heel grabber. Um, Isaac was 60 years old when the twins were born. As the boys grew, Esau became a skillful hunter as he was an outdoorsman, but Jacob was a quiet temperament, preferred to stay at home. Isaac loved Jacob. I mean, Isaac loved Esau because he enjoyed eating the wild game Esau brought home, but Jacob, um, Rebecca loved Jacob. So we see here these two twins, very different from birth. They looked different. They acted different. Their temperaments were different. The favoritism on them was different. Um, Esau was the firstborn. And so as the firstborn, he had certain rights. Certain things were just given to him, expected of him um, because of his birth. And so Esau showed contempt for this right as a firstborn. And he actually ended up trading his rights for a bowl of soup. <laughs> um, his brother, he came on from hunting, and he was wicked hungry, and his brother was cooking, and he didn't feel like cooking, and so he's like, well, can I just have what you're having? He's like, sure, for your rights as the firstborn. And he's like, I don't even care. Like, <laughs> I'm just hungry. Whatevs. And so that was the arrangement they made. 
And so in that, the Bible tells us that Esau showed contempt for his birthright. Esau was born with something. And this is from the get. This is not anything he did, but just as a matter of being born, coming out first, he was born with something. Privilege. Unmerited favoritism. Nothing that he worked for, but he got it. Abundant grace. Opportunities and exceptions that were for him that others didn't have access to. We've heard this term a lot lately um, in the terms of white privilege. And if you're not someone who's familiar with what that is, what, what is white privilege? Let me just give a little um, clarification. If you have the option whether to care or not about injustice, you have white privilege. Um, if you have a choice on whether to be anti-racist, you have privilege. If you are unaffected by and indifferent to the debasement of others, that is white privilege. Um, automatically, without trying, without anything, nothing, just from your arrival, have the benefit of the doubt, that is white privilege. Um, and this is not saying something to condemn, this is something to explain, just so you know where things are at. So we say at the foot of the cross, the ground is level. Outside the foot of the cross, it's not. <laughs> Outside, everything else is, is kind of slanted. And again, this isn't a, a condemnation, but this is to give us knowledge and awareness. So the same way that Esau had this privilege, but he didn't really respect it or value it, you can respect and value what you have if you have this privilege. It's not a condemnation, but it's saying be aware of what was gifted to you at birth and make that choice, if you choose to, to care. That's all that's saying. Um, so Esau disregarded his privilege. He didn't really care. He was born with it, didn't make a big deal to him. Um, but his father wanted to enforce it. Oftentimes, we're taught many negative things from other people. And many times, it's from a trusted source. No one's born hating someone else because of their appearance. They might have questions. The other day I was in Market Basket and there was a little girl and she was staring at me and her eyes got real big. And I was like, oh, okay, hello, little girl. You know, don't want to be stranger danger, so I'm just keeping my distance. And then I walked by and she just, and then she tugged at her mom's coat and she goes, she has blue hair. <laughs> I totally forgot that my, my hair was blue. It's been blue for years, so it's not a thing to me. Um, but for that little girl, it was like, whoa, you know. Um, <laughs> so. They notice things, and we all notice things. God's made us like that way on purpose, to be observant. Um, but there's no hostility behind the observation. The hostility needs to be taught. And oftentimes, this is enforced and taught to us by someone that we love. And because we value that relationship, we take on those opinions. Even though Esau disregarded his privilege, his father wanted to enforce it, the favoritism. So in Genesis 27, one through four, one day when Isaac was old and turning blind, he called for Esau, his son, and said, my son. Yes, father, Esau replied. I'm an old man now, Isaac said, and I don't know when I may die. Take your bow and quiver full of arrows and go into the open country to hunt for some wild game for me. Prepare my favorite dish and bring it for me to eat. Then I will pronounce a blessing that belongs to you, my firstborn son, before I die. And so in this, we kind of see a little um, trickety tricks kind of going on. Because we know, one, what God has said from the beginning, that the old is going to serve the younger. We know, two, that Esau already traded his birthright. So it's not even a thing anymore. You've given away the title. You don't own the car. Um, but now we see the father is not letting it go. He's going to make this a deal. He's going to try to manipulate the lives of his children because of his favoritism. Um, and so when Rachel heard about this, she wasn't having it. <laughs> so she put Jacob into um, switching places with the boys to try to trick the father into getting what was rightfully Jacob's. So she says, but look, um, she's like, you need to go in there and Act like you're your brother, so that way your father will bless you. While he's out there hunting, we're going to make you be him. Um, so then in verse 11 of 27, 
But look, Jacob replied to Rebekah, that's his mom, my brother Esau is a hairy man and my skin is smooth. What if my father touches me? He'll see that I'm trying to trick him and then he'll curse me instead of bless me. But his mother replied, let the curse fall on me, my son. Just do what I tell you and go get the goats. Verse 15, then she took Esau's favorite clothes, which he, uh, were there in the house, and she gave them to the younger son, Jacob. So she covered his arms and the smooth of his neck and the skin um, of young goats. Then she gave Jacob some of the delicious meal, including some fresh baked bread. So Jacob took the food to his father. My father, he said. Yes, Isaac replied. Who are you, Esau or Jacob? Jacob replied, it is Esau, your firstborn son. I have done like you told me, <laughs> and I have the wild game. Now sit up so you can eat it and give me the blessing. So Isaac blessed Jacob. Um, and in this blessing, he said, many nations are going to be your servants. Um, all who bless you are going to be blessed. All who curse you are going to be cursed. May your mother's sons bow down to you. Again, reinforcing, saying those things, putting it into the way that he wanted it because this is how he sees it, even though it's not what God said. Um, and many people come from loving homes, good people who have taught them harmful, detrimental things that are outside of what God has said about other people. And this isn't just whites to blacks. This is blacks to whites. This is a Asians to Africans. This is Germans to French. <laughs> you know, next month is coming up and everyone's going to be Irish and everyone who's not, <laughs> okay? We, we know what we're talking about here, all right? Um, but it's those opinions that get infected into that culture. And again, loving homes, good people, but infectious in their thinking. Um, and so when Esau finds out about what happens, he loses it. He, he loses his stuff. <laughs> He's like, I am going to kill this man. Um, he actually thought about it pretty rationally. He's like, I'm going to wait till my father dies because I don't want to break his heart. And then I'm going to kill this guy. Um, so anyway, his mom finds out again. She intervenes and she's like, you need to get out of here um, because bad things are going to happen. So they made up some plan like, oh, yeah, he needs to marry a wife. You know, we should send him away. And like, oh, yeah, we should. He ends up leaving. On his way out, he encounters God. This is Jacob. And he makes a vow to him. And he was like, if you, you know, will be with me, and if you'll cover me, I'm going to make you my God as well. And so he kind of um, puts that challenge towards God. When he goes to meet his uncle Laban, who is his uncle, he's super excited. He was like, oh, my own flesh and blood, you're here to, to be with me. Um, and so he's like, yes, I'm here to find a wife, all this good stuff. And Laban has two daughters, an older daughter named Leah and a younger daughter named Rachel. Jacob loved Rachel. Rachel apparently was super beautiful. Um, apparently they have a history of marrying beautiful women. <laughs> that caused trouble. Um, but Rachel um, was beautiful. And so he's like, you can have her if you work for me for seven years. Deal. Seven years for that? <laughs> Where do I sign? And so he did. He worked for him for seven years. On the wedding night, when he wakes up in the morning, he finds his bride has been switched. He got the other sister, Leah. <laughs> um, and so he, of course, he's very upset about this. And so he's like, well, you can have Rachel too, but you have to work an additional seven years. Now, if I was Jacob, I would have been like, well, she should have been on clearance because have you seen this girl? <laughs> That's a good two and a half years. <laughs> I'm already halfway there. Um, but he didn't. He was a good sport about things um, in a bad situation, and he agreed to work for him for seven more years. After this, he was like, okay, you know what? My debt is paid, I've got my family, I'd like to go now. Laban won't let him leave. He won't let him leave because everything that Jacob does is blessed. And this is because God is with Jacob. God is true to his word regardless of what goes on in our situations. God is true to his promise regardless of how people treat us or what they say about us. God is true to his word regardless of what situations come into our lives and who's misused us and who's lied on us and who's tricked us into things. And so it's really a matter of are we trusting in God and his word versus are we taking on hearsay and making that factual. And so during this time, 
where Laban um, was mistreating Jacob, he changed the arrangement for his wages 10 times. 10 times. He was supposed to get this, he ends up getting that. Okay, well now let's make it this, and then he changes this, and he changes that, and he keeps making these things. And I believe there's a lot of correlation between the black experience and Jacob, such as, to this day, blacks make about 40% less than their white counterparts in the same position. Not as a general, you know, oh, well, a janitor's gonna make less than a doctor. I mean the same position at the same job, 40% less. So for their 80,000, you know, the other person doing the same work with the same education, same experience, is getting 112,000. So now that we put it in dollars and cents, you can, you can see the difference. And so it's not that racism is always overt. It's not always, you know, a, a symbol or a sign or an anger or a hostility. But there's these other ways that we treat people as less than the value that they are and oftentimes feel justified about it because somewhere in our heart there's been a seed planted that bloomed bitterness, hatred. Um, I'm not going to get into all the facts, but even in um, places like Haiti, which we see Haiti as a very poor nation. Do you know why Haiti is poor? <laughs> it's not because the people are unwilling to work, but because at the time when they were enslaved, they fought for their freedom. And you know what? Even against a major army, they won. They actually won. And then after they won, the French government um, and, and Citibank, you know Citibank? Yeah forced them to pay $2 billion in today's money to slaves to, to pay for their freedom after they fought for it. That'd be like us winning the revolution, which we did, and now we're free in 4th of July, woo woo woo. Um, and then after winning, now you have to pay for winning because you're seen as property and not as a human. To this day, Haiti continues to struggle because of this massive debt that wasn't even cleared until 1947. Yeah, boomers were born in this time. We're not talking ancient history. A lot of times you see things, even in the civil rights movement, like these black and white pictures. Those were colored pictures. You see colored pictures of Kennedy, right? This is the same time span. We're not talking ancient history. But even in that, they make the films black and white so that way it looks like it was a long time ago. Why are you still bringing this up? It was 1947. Don't raise your hand, but if you're online or, or in the room, you know people or are people who have <laughs> born in 1947. This isn't ancient history. This is a current and present pervasive evil. Um, and because of this persistence, there were over 10,000 NGOs, which are non-government organizations in Haiti. So they're doing work that's like charity work, it's called. Um, and it's not to say that you don't help people, but because of their heaviness, it decreases the value of the work that's being done in Haiti. So the more you give them secondhand clothes, the more the manufacturers of clothes are now unemployed. Do you see what I'm saying? So even things that appear to be good, are done, and this, this is not unintentional. So I'm not saying, oh, these people are just so well-meaning. We, the church and different organizations, we give with good intentions, but the people who continue to manipulate, they know the, the truth of these situations. 80% of their 30,000 orphans in Haiti have parents. 80%. So then how are you an orphan? They're not but because their parents can't find work, they give their own children up just so that they can be cared for. Because the charity is so great that it's, it's, it's starved them out of a job. It's not that these people can't work. It's not that these people are unwilling. It's not that they're stupid. It's not that they're poor. It's not that they're helpless. It's that we continue to manipulate them and benefit from it. And these major organizations bring in billions of dollars to give their little bit of charity, and they don't have, aren't touched because they're seen as nonprofits, but all the money's going back to them. People who have different sponsorships and stuff, whatever. We met um, a man outside of um, one of the stores and stuff, and he was like talking about the different things, and we started talking with him. He gets a commission 
based on every person that signs up and donates. Commission. He's making more than a car dealership, signing people up for charity. This is an accidental, and that's why you see this in places like Haiti and Africa and different things, and not, are this, is there not other poor in the world? Of course there are. But because it's an intentional deprivation, now you can hurt them and help them by hurting them more and seeming good. Win, 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 win. Um, so Jacob worked hard. Jacob wasn't someone who didn't just slack off. Jacob was somebody who put in 20 years of work for his family. And as God blessed him, Laban started to see him differently. Laban started to have the stink eye towards him. Laban started to mistreat him even more so. And even the servants were looking at them differently. I personally believe that there is no racism without fear or jealousy. If you really think about it, okay, you hate this person, okay, why? It's not just because of their looks, but what is it about that look or those people that make you feel that way? And again, I'm not just talking white to black, I'm talking you name it. What is it that makes you feel that way? Oh, the Italians think they're so good. Oh, they are. <laughs> you seen what they do? <laughs> but it's that fear, it's that jealousy, it's that personal feelings of inadequacy that they use to fuel their hatred. And because they're so afraid and they feel so inept that they turn it into hate. Because as long as I'm pointing the finger at you, I don't have to look at me. And so Jake, uh, Laban treated his family like this. And this is so important because remember how at the beginning he was like, oh, my own flesh and blood, oh yeah, yada yada, so good to see him. But yet he treats him this way. We need to recognize who we are. When you feel that hate, that rage, that anger, that fear, that jealousy towards another human being that's a child of God, and you name the name of Christ, that's your flesh and blood. That's, that is your brother. That is your sister. That is your responsibility. And so God directed Jacob to return home. Um, he leaves and Laban pursues after him um, in anger, but fortunately God met Laban first and like, hey, knock this off. Um, and so there was peace that was brought between the two of them. After that, Jacob needs to continue to go home. And this is where the real test comes in. When you have to face your family. <laughs> when you have to go back to that source that caused all that conflict in the first place. When, when you have to deal with those people um, that you love, but that have fed you a lie your whole life. Um, those people that have put those negative seeds inside of you, those people that have put others, even your own family, against you, those people who look down on you because of who you were. Um, and so on his way, he prays. Um, 32.9, he says, O oh God of my grandfather Abraham, God of my father Isaac, O oh Lord, you told me, return to your own land and to your relatives and you promise me I will treat you kindly. In this prayer, he does something. He humbles himself. He humbles himself. He's not me, I, we, they. He takes this responsibility. He makes the situation personal. He sees himself as who he is. Not what my mom, my dad, we've always thought. We've Humbles himself. I am not worthy of your unfailing love and faithfulness. You have shown to me, your servant. That's who we answer to. That's who we're accountable to. Christ is the standard. Everything else is hearsay. 
He humbles himself. He acknowledges God and what he has done. When I left home and crossed the Jordan River, I had nothing but a walking stick. Now my household fills two large camps. We can all look in our lives and say what God has done for us. Regardless of how hard it may have been, different challenges and stuff, we can all personally say, God, I remember when. We just have to be cognizant and be aware and intentionally look. Because if all we look at is what we don't have and who didn't treat us right and what we didn't get and why, who, what, all we're going to do is complain. It doesn't mean God hasn't been good. It means that we've been ungrateful. And so when we take that look at who God has been to us and how he tries to show himself continually to us at this place, at that place, at this time, with this situation, with that situation, when I cried out to God and he heard me, and I said, God, I promise I'll never do it again, and then three times later I just stopped even thanking him. He acknowledged who God was and what God has done. And he does something awesome. He asked for God's intervention. Don't just know God as God and not seek him for God. He asked for God's intervention. He makes himself open to hear what thus saith the Lord not just for curiosity or entertainment's sake, so that he can personally make changes in his life. Regardless of what the source was, regardless of you know anything else, me, I'm taking responsibility. This is where I am with things. I stand unworthy. I need your help. He asked for God's intervention. Oh Lord, rescue me from the hand of my brother Esau. I am afraid. I am afraid. Do you know how hard those three words are? If you don't know, ask yourself when's the last time you said it. But how many times have you felt it? And it comes out like anger. And, and it comes out like hate. And it comes out like jealousy. And it comes out like rage. And it comes out as restlessness. And it comes out as anxiety. I am afraid. When we come to God, or when we're walking with Christ, there's no difference um, in sovereignty. It never changes. The same way that you needed him so much to come to him is the same way you need him every day after knowing him. And the same way that he has a purpose and a plan for your life and a direction, that plan continues. We've all used our phones and our GPS or whatever we use to get around and stuff, whatever, and we have a destination set, and then sometimes we miss a turn or we do something, stuff, whatever, we calculating. The destination never changes, but because of the error of our ways, we need to correct. And if we don't, we'll never get it. It's not that it hasn't been set, but one, you have to say, I am here. What is your current location? How stands the case between you and God? Do you personally know him? Is he the God of your fathers? Is he the God on the shelf? Is he that book that your parents read? How is the case with you personally and God? And if you know God, how are things with you and him? Is he just your just in case? Or is he your everyday lead me, guide me? And so he looks to God in these times of uncertainty. He looks forward in faith, with trust, and in assurance for the now. I don't need to explain to you about COVID and everything else going on in life and everything, <laughs> all of the above, because you've lived it and you know it, and yet God's plans haven't changed. Yet that word that he spoke in the beginning will still persist and prevail. Yet those intentions that he has for you, those things that he's called you to be, are still in effect. So many times, um, you know, we seek God when we get, you know, into a situation, and it's like, well, God, now what? Same thing as last time, recalculating. Destination hasn't changed. 
Christ is still the standard. And until we measure up to that, we need to continue to press towards the mark for that high calling. And so he says, but you have promised me I will surely treat you kindly and I will multiply your descendants until they become as numerous as the seashores, too many to count. He remembers those things that God has said. So many times when we're uncertain, if we'll just go back to the source, we really will find the answer. We really, truly will. Don't raise your hand, not even if you're online. <laughs> but how many times, rough average, in a day, do you not know something and Google it? A week, a month an hour. And if you're like me, you'll think of something, get on your phone to Google it, get distracted for 10 minutes, and then be like, what was I looking for? <laughs> imagine, just out of your wild imagination, imagine if we actually thought God knew more. Because if we did, we'd seek him. So Jacob gets to the point where he comes to the end of himself. Um, verses 22 and 23 talks about how he sends his possessions and his whole family, and he sends them on ahead. And during the night, it says he was left there alone, and there a man met with him. Someone came to where he was, and they fought it out. I mean, they, they duped it. This wasn't a, this wasn't a tea party. This was strength against strength. This was might against might. This was contact. There was no six feet apart. This was up close and personal. This is in your face. And what happened is he wrestled and he fought. We need to get to the place where we're left alone with God and we fight it out. And I'm not saying, you know, yelling at God and raising your voice, but really coming to the place where you're honest, where he's in your face and you're in his. God, this is my heart. God, these are my children. God, I don't know how to fix this. God, I'm afraid. Will you make yourself vulnerable? Will you come to that point where you wrestle with these things, those things that you ignore all day and that keep you up all night? those reasons why you keep making those same mistakes, keep dating the same person with a different name, those reasons why no one that they you know, pick is good enough, and it's really your fear of letting go. Wrestle with God. Wrestle, and I'm not talking about fighting and trying to convince him to change his mind. What I'm talking about is coming to the place where you're honest with God and you go through these difficult things until you surrender. Fighting until you surrender. Until God has you in the place where you're like, I give. I give. In wrestling, they have a lot of different things that they're called submission holds. You, you don't kill the person, but you get them to a position where they give up. God does this with his love. <laughs> that overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. This is why it's reckless, because it chases us down, and it fights until we're found, and it will leave the 99 and come after us, each individually and personally, and pursue us until we yield, until we submit. And I don't mean just once but I mean every day, and in every way, and in every aspect, and in every area for all of our lives. He gets to this point where he wrestles with God, and in verse 26, then the man says, let me go, the day is breaking, but Jacob said, I will not let you go until you bless me. What is your name, the man asked. He replied, Jacob. Your name is no longer Jacob, the man told him. From now on, you will be called Israel, because you have fought with God and men and won. 
from that time, God became his God, the God of Israel, but he also became Israel. He also took on the responsibility of accepting who God had called him to be. God who has that purpose, who has that plan, who has that destination, who I love how the scripture says, knit you together in your mother's womb. I love to see people crocheting and it just looks like a bunch of string and the next thing you know, clickety clack, clickety clack, and now it's a string, now it's a thing, now it's a thing, now it's a coat. Oh my goodness, it's a coat from a ball of yarn. God does that with us. Our personality traits aren't missed stitches. They're intentionally put into the design. They're intentional characteristics. Our tendencies, our habits, all intentional for his glory. The problem is, are we using this for ourselves? Are we using this for him? Are we being who he's called us to be? Which most of us don't even know, to be honest. But I'll tell you a hint. It looks like Christ. We may not know what it will be, but we do know that we shall become like him. And so we need to continually press towards that. We need to continually fight it out. We need to continually submit because he's called us so much higher. He wants to bring us so much deeper. He wants to draw us so much closer so that way we can know him even as we're known. He knows everything about us, our thoughts before we even think them. When, when, when we think our thoughts, it's like reading yesterday's newspaper. <laughs> Already knows. But when we come to God with dishonesty or only half-hearted, we can't really say that he hasn't done his part. We haven't given him all the pieces. But when we walk into Christ, when we surrender those things, when we become who God has called us to be, that which people have said is cursed, God calls blessed. That which those others that might have tried to minimize, God multiplies. They might be angry with your gifts. They might not understand who you really are. Keep being gifted. They might fear you because of your abilities. Keep being capable. They might be jealous because you're blessed. Keep being blessed. Keep being who God has called you to be. It's not about you trying to convince the world. It's about you standing before an audience of one so that he can say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. It's not about what other people call you or how they've labeled you or how they might perceive you as a heel, as a trickster, as a name it, whatever. God calls you a prince, a princess, and one who will prevail. And when I say prince or princess, I'm not just talking about, oh, that's a cute term that means you have stuff and you get away with things. But that means that you're in a place of authority. You've been given privilege. Me, everyone. We've been given privilege. At our birth, God so loved us. He gave us unmerited favoritism, had nothing to do with what we've done. He loved us so much that he gave. We have privilege. You have privilege. You have the right to be like, you know what? Jesus died, but I don't care. We can choose to be indifferent. We have privilege. We can say whom that we will serve this day. It doesn't matter if you have to work harder or longer or be unappreciated and recognized. God is for you. And if God be for you, <laughs> it is more than the world being against you. Not even equal. It's more than. Because greater is he that is within you than he that's out there in the world. It's not about who doesn't love you. It's not about what they've called you. 
It's not about the examples that have been set before you. If your father was a liar and your grandfather was a liar and they put their families, um, let them suffer at the expense of, of you. And this is what happened with um, Jacob's family. It's not about if you even knew your father or if you had a good relationship with him. It's about the Father's love that pursues you. It's about who God's called you. And when you are who God has called you to be, you don't have to pretend to be someone else. You don't have to change your hair. <laughs> you don't have to put on the appearance to look like what you think the standard is. But God accepts you in your you for who he's called you to be and wants to draw you up higher to where he's at. This is the challenge that's set before us today. This is the opportunity that we have. God has spoken over each and every one of our lives. He's just waiting for us to surrender and submit. I pray that you would. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Sister Tori. That was better than this morning, actually. A little more detail there, but thank the Lord for that. As Tori was, was sharing, I, I kept thinking about uh, where we are, <clears throat> where we've been as a church the last couple of weeks. I've been preaching on God's agape, right? The, the, you mentioned it, the unconditional, immeasurable love of God, you know, that he pours out up, upon all of us. And uh, how Jesus said, now that I love you, I, I'm calling on you to love everybody else the same way, or to love each other the same way. And those on the outside will know you're my disciples by your love for one another. And uh, I kept thinking about that, that it, it doesn't matter. I mean, we're talking about, you know, racial issues. It's, it's, it, it could be an age difference. It could be a, a social standing difference. There are so many prejudices in, the, in our culture. It's crazy. But what happens in when, when we come to know Christ and we're represented in a church setting like we are, uh, we have a challenge before us to love everyone the way God loved us. And the people on the outside that are not, not Christians will see the love that we have for one another in spite of racial differences or where we, what country we come from or what language is our natural language or our age differences or our social standing or whatever. When people on the outside see the love that we have for each other, they'll be attracted to that love. And they'll know that we are Christ's disciples. There is there's something I just want to share quickly. In Mark chapter 7, uh, Jesus tells us something that we all know. But let me just reiterate what we all know. He, Jesus said, from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lewdness, and evil lie, blasphemy, pride, and foolishness. In other words, Yuck. <laughs> All these things come from within and defile a man. And that's how, and God loves us in spite of all that, right? And he pours his agape love into us, and guess what? He changes our hearts. Hallelujah. But it all, it all starts with his move and our response to his move. And when we respond to his move, his agape, we respond to his agape love, that agape is poured out into us. Yeah, he chases us down many times. And he fills us and begins to change our heart so that we can love people different than ourselves. And again, racial, uh, cultural, social, age, whatever. It doesn't matter what it is. He, he pours that love into us so that we could do that and be a light to the world around us. Isn't that great how God does it? This is amazing, but this is Christianity. And, uh, Tori, thank you for your word. I, I, I want to take that and listen to it again, actually. I'll get the video later. But uh, there were a lot of great things that were said there. So can we stand together? Um, I, want to, I want to do something. Uh, first of all, let's stand. But I want to, can we have some ladies stand with Maria back there and pray over her? Maria slipped on the 
come into the church and bumped her head. I, I know, Mark, I don't mean to embarrass you, but I just want to, ladies, just lay hands on her and pray for her, okay? I just want to begin to intercede. I'll lead out in prayer, but you could begin to intercede for her. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Uh, thank you, Lord. Those of you at home, just we're going to have a, a short time of prayer, so if you could make an altar, just get alone with God for a few minutes, that would be wonderful. Lord, we just lift up Maria to you right now, Lord. Uh, thank you that she's okay. Thank you that she's okay. But we pray, Lord, that uh, there won't be any lasting effects from, that, from her, her, her spill in the parking lot. Uh, heal her, strengthen her, encourage her today, and uh, may the love of God just be poured out all over her. Thank you that she's here. And uh, may she continue to, to be able to come and to attend church services. And so, Lord, with that, I want to lift up anyone that's feeling uh, like they have a health issue or maybe there's some things going on in our lives. We just pray, Lord, that you would bring healing and strength to our body, soul, and spirit right now in the name and authority of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Okay, now, before we say the final prayer, I want to give you all an opportunity uh, to respond to the Lord. So uh, as you get situated, every, every head bowed for just a moment. And I, I want to give you an opportunity because Jesus always asks for a reaction, a response. And the, re the, the question is, did you hear the, the word of God today? Did you hear the word of God that's challenging us to dare to trust Jesus with our lives in spite of how we were brought up or what our, what our expectations were, what our family expectations were, do you hear the voice of God calling you today, saying, are you willing to step away from what you were brought up with and put me first and foremost in your life? I can tell you personally from my, my wife and I, we were in that position many years ago to step away from our own uh, family traditions and culture and so forth to take a, a, a lonely position to receive Christ as our, life, as our Savior and Lord and, and how the Lord has blessed us because we took that step. And so it, it always comes down to that first step. So without anyone looking around, I'm, I'm not going to ask you to make a step physically. I'm just going to ask you to raise your hand and wave at me so just so I know what's going on. And I'd like to meet with you later if possible. But is there anyone like that, that you feel like you're at a place in your life right now where things are going good maybe, you know, but you feel in your spirit that things are not going well spiritually for you because you know, you know something now. You know right now you know that God's knocking on your heart and wants to come into your life. And you have the key to that. You can open it or keep it shut. But I wonder if there's anyone just feels like, I want to begin this relationship with God. Just raise your hand real quick if that's you. Thank you over there. Praise God. Anyone else with this one? Just raise your hand quickly. I, I, I want to begin this walk with God. I want to thank you. All right. Praise the Lord. Oh, I see a little hand over there. Praise the Lord for that. All right, very good. Praise God. Okay, so I'm going to lead in a simple prayer. Uh, this is just the beginning, but uh, let's all pray this prayer together if we can do that. Just repeat after me if you can. Dear Heavenly Father, dear Heavenly Father, I need you in my life. I believe in you. I believe in Jesus, that he died for my sins and rose from the dead, ascended into heaven. And I believe that Jesus has a plan for my life. So right now, I lay down my life. I confess my sins before you, Lord. I repent, but I receive your grace. I receive your forgiveness, and I receive new life in Christ Jesus. And so, Lord, right now, come on, Lord, right now, I surrender, and I'm going to trust you to lead me in my next steps of faith. Send your Holy Spirit. Let your word speak to me. And, Lord, if I'm not, help me get plugged into a church. Come on, if I'm not, help me get plugged into a church where I can learn the word of God. In Jesus' name. I'm going to pray. Father, Lord, thank you that we could say that prayer 
those in the sanctuary, those at home. Thank you, Lord, for, for a few that raised their hands today of invitation. We pray, Lord, especially for those that made that, that commitment for the first time or maybe a renewal, that your blessing will be upon them so richly and powerful that they'll know without a shadow of a doubt that you're working deep in their heart during these days. So, Lord, thank you for this time. Thank you, Lord, for Tori's word. Thank you for Tori and Alan being here with us today. May your blessing be upon the Rogers family in the name of Jesus. Lord, continue to open up doors of ministry for both of them as they are, they are choice vessels of yours to proclaim the word of God and to, and to equip and teach the body of Christ. We pray for that. And, Lord, for all of us, let us get home safely. Let us have a good day. Let us have a good week. But Lord, let it be a week of awakenings in our spirit that we will be aware of the things that were said in this sermon today as we live our lives day to day. We thank you. We praise you for it now. Hallelujah. In Jesus' precious holy name we pray. And everybody said, everybody said, amen and amen. Go in victory and go in peace. Hallelujah.